Okay. Huge vote. If someone's loan document was erased, witnesses attest to it, and he comes before the court and they draw up a validation, the document of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so was erased at such and such a date, and so-and-so and so-and-so were his witnesses. If one paid part of his debt, Rabbi Yehuda says he should exchange the document. Rabbi Yossi says he should write a receipt. Said Rabbi Yehuda, the results in his needing to safeguard his receipt from the mice. Rabbi Yossi said to him, it is fitting for him so that this one's position should not be impaired. If there were two brothers, one poor and one wealthy, and the father left them a bathhouse or an olive press, if he had made them, if he had made them for renting, the rent is divided. If he made them for themselves, the wealthy one can say to the poor one, acquire servants and let them bathe in the bathhouse, acquire olives and can process them in the olive press. Two people in the same town, both named Yosef and Shimon, cannot produce a document of indebtedness against each other, nor can another produce a document of indebtedness against them. If one found among his documents a receipt saying the note of Yosef and Shimon is paid, both their notes are treated as paid. What should they do? They should record the third generation if they were identical. For three generations, they should write a description. If they were alike, they should write Kohen. If someone said to his son, one of my notes is paid, but I do not know which. All the notes are paid. If two notes from one person were found there, the larger one is treated as paid, and the smaller one is not considered paid. One who lends to another through a guarantor may not collect from the guarantor. If he said, on condition that I collect from whomever I wish, he may collect from the guarantor. Rabbi Ben Shimon Gan Gamil says, in either case, if the borrower has property, he may not collect from the guarantor. And similarly, Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamil said, if one was a guarantor of a woman's kasuba and a husband was divorcing her, he must vow not to derive any further benefit from her to prevent them from planning against one another's property, this one's property, and then remarry it. Okay. One more. One, one lends another money with a document, collects for mortgage properties with witnesses. He collects only from available properties. If he produces his handwritten note that he is indebted to him, he collects only from available properties. If a guarantor appears that the documents are uh, sitting, I'm sorry. If the, if they if a guarantor appears below the document's signatures, he collects only from available properties. A case came before Rabbi Mishael and he said he collects only from available properties. Ben Nana said to him he collects neither from mortgage properties nor from available properties. He said to him why, and he said to him, if someone was choking someone in the street, and another accountant had said, let him alone, he's exempt, because he did not lend him due to his trust in him. Rather, which is which is a guarantor who is liable? If he said, lend him, and I will lend you. He is liable because he lent him due to his trust in him. Rabbi Yisrael said, one who wishes to become wise should involve himself in the study of monetary laws, as there is no branch of Torah greater than them, because they are like a welling fountain. And one who wishes to involve himself in monetary values should serve Shimon ben Okay, Sanhedrin. Okay, so Maseches Sanhedrin opens up with... Um, with a discussion of the different uh, types of bate dinim that can be con uh, that can be convened and for what uh, for what purposes you need how many judges. So, I left it on my shelf. Sorry, I left it on ahead. my shelf. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Wow, you've got the full family there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because when I leave, I put them outside, and you know, and they, they go in the little cage they have there. And when I come in, they all run to the door as soon as they see me come up the steps. So this is <laughs> okay. All right, I'm fine. All right, so okay. starting off, starting off with the smallest bati dinim. So the, the 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 sequence of mishnayos is that we're going to be de be showing which are uh, which are the um, the bati dinim that have the smallest requirements, and then uh, and then we'll grow them. Dine mamanos shlosha. So anything to do with monetary law when it comes to loans or um, um, or or anything where it's, where it's pretty pretty simple. The, and what's actually not stated over here is hediotas. You can even have three three simple guys here because this is not um, this is not rocket science. If somebody has a loan and he's got a, and he produces a document and, uh, and 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 wants to and wants to get his money back, you don't need uh, you don't need somebody with a uh, with Dionys to be able to say okay, pay him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so so this so this is this is a um, this can be a base team of uh, of three simple guys, or, or even or, um, as a matter of fact, I think you can even uh, under some circumstances you could use one uh, one um, Diane Mumche, one one Diane uh, Mumche, one one expert judge who can do this. Okay. Okay. Now, when it comes to things where, where things were stolen or where chavalos is, is injuries that were caused to a person, so that's also a three, but in this case, you actually need expert judges because they've got to be able to assess how much the damages are, um, and it, it starts becoming a little bit more complicated, and we kind of left the, we left the lay judges behind. Okay. So when it comes to uh, other damages, yeah, um, when it's when it's done by a tam or tashlume kefil, uh, the penalty for having stolen and having now you have to pay double or four or five for stealing an ox or a sheep um, and, and slaughtering it. Okay, that's uh, that that needs three that needs three expert judges. So um, also the, the rapist, the seducer, and uh, Amoti Shema, that's the one who makes up the who makes up the um uh, the accusation against his new wife that she wasn't a that she wasn't a virgin. And um they these three cases get uh, get um 200, 200 and 400 zoos um respectively, or what's what's called um uh, 50, 50 shekels in the in the Torah. Um, which is what we call a seller um, um, in 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 our in our parlance. Okay, so <coughs> um, so that's also with three judges, the three expert judges. Divrei Rav Meir. So Ravi Meir says that that those things that all of them need only three judges. Why? What's the dispute? Chachamim Amrim Moti Shemra Beisrim Veshlosha Ifnei Sheyesh Bodin and Nefasha. Say say wait a second. The Moti Shemra is coming with an accusation of adultery against his wife. Mm -hmm. So, if, you know, if it turns out that that he's lying and uh, and he and he needs to pay her, you know, the hundred the hundred um, so, uh, shekels, then then she's there, then you only need three. But if it turns out the other way around and he can actually prove his accusation, and um, then we're, then we're talking about the end of because we're going to execute this woman for adultery. Right. Okay, so then, so therefore, we have to start this with the uh, with twenty three. Rabbi Meir agrees that if it if it had to come down to the nefashas, you would come to twenty three. But he says, let's start out with three, and uh, and just give him, uh, you know, if it's a monetary award, then we're done. We don't need to bring the whole the whole court together. Uh, but if it, and if it turns out that there's actually a real accusation against the woman, then we can bring in the extra judges. But the chachamim say it's not uh, that's not how we do it. We, you've got to pull everything together. Uh, at the from the beginning, and that's the halacha. Yeah. Mishnah base, makos bishlosha. If somebody is pulled into base and he needs to be lashed um, for for breaking a, a mitzvah ase, a mitzvah um, then he's uh, then you need a, a, again three judges. Mishum Rabbi Yishmael omer beshrim bishlosha, but Rabbi Yishmael disagrees and says no. Uh, makos is 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 like dina nefashos because you're actually literally whipping the guy within an inch of his life. And Marcos is like a um, Marcos is like a, a substitute for for a death penalty. It's like you know, as a matter of fact, I heard this explained interestingly uh, in terms of Hashkafa. Is like why is it that a that a goy, if a goy violates one of his seven mitzvahs, he gets a death penalty straight. Whereas like even for stealing, he'd get a death penalty for stealing. So why wouldn't uh, uh, so why wouldn't a Jew so 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 why why is a Jew get this, uh, this, this gets off lightly he just gets lashed for, for violating one of his mitzvahs no it's a it's a kula on a Jew it's not a kumra on the guy because everyone who violates Hashem's will should you know you, you forfeited your right to exist Hashem Hashem created you Hashem gave you rules to to abide by and if you don't keep your rules you don't you don't really deserve to be alive. Okay, so so what's it with so what's with the lashes? The lashes is is like a is a substitute because you've got a potential to to turn yourself around and, and fix yourself up. So you only get lashes instead of a death penalty, and that's and I, that may be sort of the sheet of Rabbi Ishmael over here that uh, that when you're giving lashes, you have to have twenty three people because it's uh, because it's like a din in a fascist. However, the the halakha follows the the, the Tanakhama here. We say we say in. 
I, I, maybe it's Yom Kippur. That, that Hashem doesn't wish for the death of a person. He wishes them to yes, repent. To cool. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Ibor HaChodesh. So um, the Ibor HaChodesh, well, let's um, call, call him Rosh Chodesh. So um, um, it's it, it's interesting phraseology that it uses here, the Ibor HaChodesh. It's actually the, the non-Ibor of the Chodesh that we were talking about. Because if the if the if, if Rosh Chodesh if the month is twenty nine days that's when you need a base in to declare it but if it if it if it falls over to thirty days you don't even need the base in to say anything because it automatically is thirty days if no witnesses <coughs> on the twenty ninth day right so um so that's uh, so Ibar Chodesh is b'shlosha you you need three you need three judges to to declare Rosh Chodesh again expert judges Ibar Hashana and um, and when it's deciding whether it's time to add in an extra adar, this gets bishlosh uh, Rabbi Meir. So Rabbi Meir says it's enough to have three. Rabban Shemon ben Gamliel Meir bishlosh He says no, it's not so pasha that you just do it with three. If you have if you have three, uh, you start up you start up with three. Uber chamisha nosnim nosnim. So he says but. Um, if the if there's a if there's a split decision that um, if if they if they vote clearly two against one that uh, that we we're not doing Ibar Kodesh we're just letting we're just going straight into uh, into Nissan then then the matter is finished but if they vote two against one that we that we want to do an Ibar Ashana uh, we want to add an, a second Adar right. so then we've got to bring in two more judges to to discuss this more okay. The Gomer and the Shiva, and if they and if they vote three against two, that they want to uh, that they want to do an Ibor Hashana, then then we bring in another two judges to make it seven. The, uh, the Gomer and the Shiva, and so it can go up to seven judges to decide on the on the extra month. Okay, the Im Gomer Bishloshan will various, but we don't have to get there because if the first three judges are unanimous that you need that we need to add an extra month, then we don't need to trouble anyone else. Uh, we, we, it's, it's, it must be an obvious call, and therefore we, therefore we can do Ibar Hashana straight away with three. Okay, and that is the halacha, uh, like Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, not like Rabbi Meir. All right, Mishnah Gimel, smichas zakenim varifas egla bishlosha. So giving giving smicha to uh, this is the original smicha we're talking about um, from Yeshua. Well, what Moshe gave to Yeshua and passed on. So that smicha should be done in front of in front of three judges. So so to the um, the egla arufa, for which is the atonement for uh, for an unknown right. murderer. Okay, Diver Rabbi Shimon. So this is the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Yehuda Omer Bechamisha. No, you need five people. Okay, well, how does he learn five? We actually learned this recently in Sota. Remember in Sota there was a there was a drasha from the Psukim. Um, because it's Zikne Haida, the Samchus Zikne Haida, yes, you day him. Um, you got two, the two people. Okay, Zikne is uh, Ishnaim. Um, and uh, hold on, there was, you know, which Dosha? Okay. Um, because because he's he, he's uh, because uh, the first the first opinion of Rabbi Shimon is saying you, all you've got is zikne haida that's two uh, the, the minimum of two uh, of, of plural is two and since you can't have an even based in you have to make it into three um, but the um, the the opinion of uh, Rabbi Yehuda says the Chamisha says now the two psukim samchu is zikne haida the samchu is two zikne is another two because who, who, well, who's doing it if not the zikne uh, zikne haida? The samchu. Let, let leave out the zikne haida. So the, they're learning out that there are actually two pairs of two here. That makes four. And again, you can't have an even number of people on the base. So you have to add one to make it five. And that was the halakha that we that we passed in in, in Sota without we, we didn't even quote Rabbi Shimon at the time. Um, so it's uh, in, uh, that's clearly the pasuk in halacha is that that we have uh, five judges for the egla rufa. Chalitza v'hameonim b'shlosha. Um, woman giving uh, a woman doing chalitza with the yavam, and also um, an underage an underage girl uh, who's been given in marriage to uh, by her mother and brothers, which is a marriage to Ravonin, where she has the option of 
simply refusing her husband and walking out on him, that mion has to be done in front of a, uh, in front of three judges. Neta revai umas sheni she'en damav yudin. Now, um, when you have uh, neta revai and mas and and mas sheni, um, remember what what's the din of neta revai and mas sheni? The very similar din between the two of them. Um, you have to you have to re redeem the produce if, unless you want to schlep all the produce to Yerushalayim. You redeem it onto money, and then you take the money to Yerushalayim and you eat, and you buy food over there. Now, what happens? That that's all great for for produce where you have you know what the market price is. But when you have uh, the produce that doesn't have a a fixed market value, for example, let's say his produce started to spoil, it's still got some value. But it's worth less than it used to be, and we're not entirely sure. So now we need some people who who can actually give you a fair assessment of what the what the value is, so you can know how much you can um, what you can redeem it on. Bishloshe. So you need a base in of three to to give a proper value of it. Hekdesh or bishloshe. Also with hekdesh, if you're redeeming hekdesh, you need three uh, you need three uh, three uh, dayanim to to tell you how much you have to redeem it for. Harachin hamitzaltelin bishloshe. So. And uh, evaluations of of movable property of um, is is also done with three. Rabbi Yehuda Mer Echad Mehen Kohen, and Rabbi Yehuda says that one of those three has to be has to be a Kohen. Um, why? Because uh, because the pasuk says uh, Kohen from 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 the pasuk over there. Um, that which honestly I think I think that pasuk. Kerekeh Chana Kohen is actually referring to landed property, but I think he learns out from there too. Because um, otherwise, why would the Tanakama be able to say it doesn't have to be a Kohen? Um, do you happen to have a commentary on uh, on why Rabbi Yehuda says Kohen and the, uh, and the Tanakama? Yes, yeah, um, uh, by nine and a Kohen, it says the Torah mentions the word Kohen ten times in the passage concerning Arachim. Um, and redemption of the temple property, thereby indicating that 10 people must be involved in the assessment. Having mentioned the fact that it must be done by a Kohen once, it was necessary to constantly repeat it. It is therefore understood that these extra mentions of Kohen come in fact to teach that a Kohen is not necessary for the additional assessors. Since there are nine redundant references to a Kohen, nine of the 10 assessors need not be Kohanim and only one must. Okay, so that's in the last sentence, right? So that, that's the Karkaos. So when they're mm -hmm. evaluating land for redemption, that's Tisha of a Kohen, that's nine, uh, nine Israelim and one Kohen, Adam, Kiyotse Bahen. And same thing goes for uh, for assessments of people when they're doing Arachim of people. Remember, we, we had this thing about uh, uh, Erech, uh, well, Erech we, is, is fixed, but Demei Ploni alive. So if somebody says Demei Ploni alive, then we have to assess how much he would he would fetch in the, in the slave market. Oh, right. Okay. That's it, okay. and we can go back to uh, Baba Bastra. <clears throat> okay, Let's see. Here we are. Uh, hey, you know. The daughters of uh, Sefer Al-Khad, okay. you know that, yeah. took three shares in the inheritance, the share of their father who was among those who left Egypt, and his share among his brothers in the state of Hefer. That and that which being a firstborn, he takes two portions. <clears throat> both the son, both the son and the daughter have the same law concerning inheritance, except that the son takes a double share of the father's estate, but does not take a double share of the mother's estate. And the daughters are supported by the father's estate, but they're not supported from the mother's estate. And one who says that man, my firstborn son, shall not take a double share, or that my man, uh, that man, my son, shall not inherit with his brothers, has not said anything because he has stipulated contrary to what is written in the Torah. One who apportions his estate to his sons orally, increasing the debt, the share of one and increasing the share of one, uh, making the first point equal to them, his words are upheld. But if he said anything that it was to be, by inheritance, he has not said anything. If he wrote whether in the beginning, the middle, or the end that it was to be a gift, his words are upheld. One who says that man shall inherit me in the case in which there is a daughter, or my daughter shall inherit me in the case in which there is a son, he has not said anything because he has stipulated contrary to what is written by the Torah. Rabbi Yochanan ben uh, Broca says, if he said this about one who is who is eligible for the inheritance, his words are upheld. And about one who is not eligible for the inheritance, his words are not upheld. One who signs over his property to another and sets aside his sons, what, what he did is done, but the sages are not pleased with him. 
And Shimon Gamaliel says, if, one, if his sons did not con uh, conduct themselves properly, he is remembered for good. Okay. One who says that, no, that's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So tomorrow we'll start with Sanhedrin and then go to the, the Kazara. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Baba Mitzia. Okay, Chet Aleph. If one borrowed a cow and borrowed the service of its owner along with it, or hired its owner along with it, or he borrowed the service of the owner or hired him and afterwards borrowed the cow and it died, he's exempt, as it is said. If his owner is with him, he did not pay. But if he borrowed the cow and afterwards borrowed the service of the owner or hired him and it died, he is liable. As it is said, if his owner is not with him, he shall surely pay. If one borrowed a cow and has neither borrowed it for half a day and hired it for half a day, or borrowed it for one day and hired it for the next day, or hired one and borrowed one and it died, the lender claims that the borrower one died, or that it died on the day it was borrowed, or that it died during the hour that it was borrowed, while the other one says that he does not know, he's liable. If the rent is set, claims that the hired one died and that it died on the day it was hired, or that he died during the hour it was hired, while the other one says that he does not know, he is exempt. If this one claims it was the borrow, borrowed one, and this one claims it was the hired one, the renter swears that the hired one died, and if this one says he does not know, and this one says he does not know, they divide. If one borrowed a cow and sent it to him through his son, through his slave, through his agent, and through the son, slave, or agent of the borrower, and it died, he is exempt. If the borrower said to him, send it to me through my son, through my slave, through my agent, and through your son, through your slave or through your agent, or the lender said to him, I am sending it to you through my son, through my slave, or through my agent, and through your son, through your slave, and through your agent, and the borrower replied, send it, and he sent it, and it died, he is liable. So it's at the time that he returns it. Okay. Okay, it gets an LFA. Uh, every document which has a proof and witness on it is void, except for Gittin and the documents of emancipation of slaves. It once occurred that they brought before Rebbe Gamil on Kapar Usne a uh, begat whose witnesses were Kuthins, and he validated it. All documents which are processed in Gentile courts, so all the signatures of Gentiles are valid except for Gittin and documents of emancipation of slaves. Rebbe Shimon says they were also valid, but they were not mentioned as being void except they were, they were made by a private individual. One who says, give this gift to my wife or this document of emancipation to my slave. If he wants to retract in both of those cases, he can retract. These are the words of a mayor. The sages, however, say in cases of getting, but not in cases of documents of emancipation of slaves, because we can benefit a person in his absence. But we cannot cause detriment to a person except in his presence. For if he wants to refrain from supporting a slave, he is permitted. But to refrain from supporting his wife, he is not permitted. He said to them, "This, but this is disqualifying a slave from eating truma, just as he is disqualifying his wife. They said to him, this is because he is in his possession. It is, he is in possession. If someone says, give this gift to my wife or this document of emancipation to my slave, and he dies, they shall not give it after his death. If one says, give a hundred Jews to so-and-so, and he dies, they shall give it after his death. If one brought a gift from overseas and said it was written in my presence, but not, but not, it was signed in my presence, or it was signed in my presence, but not, it was written in my presence, or all of it was written in my presence and half of it was signed in my presence, or half of it was written in my presence and all of it was signed in my presence, it's void. If one says it was written in my presence and one says it was signed in my presence, it is void. If two say it was written in our presence and one says it was signed in my presence, it's void. Maybe who says who however validates it if one says it was written in my presence and two say it was signed in my presence, it's valid. Okay. If if one that's was it. written by day, oh, you're, it, you're, you're, yeah, that's it. If one ate and drank in a single period of forgetfulness, he is liable for only one sin. If one ate and did work on your kipper, he is liable for two sin offerings. If one ate foods that are not fit for consumption and drank liquids unfit for drinking, for example, he drank brine and salted fish fats, he is not liable for a sin offering. We do not afflict the children on Yom Kippur. Well, we train them prior to the previous year or prior to two years so that they should be accustomed to commandments. If pregnant women uh, smelled food or drink and requested they feed her until she recovers, uh, a sick person, they feed him according to the advice of experts. 
When there's no experts are present, they feed him and relying on his own opinion until he says enough. Okay. Look at him. Gimel. Gimel. The carcass of a non-kosher animal anywhere, and the carcass of a kosher bird in villages require thought, but they do not require hechsher. The carcass, carcass of a kosher animal anywhere, and the carcass of a kosher bird in Caleb in the marketplace neither require thought nor hechsher. Rabbi Shimon says also a camel, hyrax, and pig. Dill, once it has imparted its flavor to a pot of food, is no longer subject to the laws of truma, but it does contract uh, tumors to ocalin. Branch shoots and those of Adal and the leaves of the wild luft do not contract tumors alkalin until they are sweetened. And Reb Shimon says also the shoots of Pacios are like them. Uh, Costas, ginger, fragrant herbs, uh, tia, as, as for tia, pepper, and saf, sapphire, sapphire loaves may be purchased with money of mice and shani, but they do not contract tumor in the alkalin, tumors alkalin. They are the words of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Yochan and Ben Nori said to him, "If they may not be, if they may be purchased with mice shady money, why do they not contract tumor with alkaline? And if they not contract with alkaline, why should they not be purchased with mice uh, shady money?" Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 The roots of a commonest tree that extend to the hectish field or the roots of hectish fields that extend to a commonest field are not permitted for both benefit and not subject to me'ila. The spring that flows from a field of hectish is not permitted for benefit, but is not subject to me'ila. Once the water flows out of the hectish field, it may drive, one may derive benefit from it. The libation water that is in the golden jug is not permitted for benefit, but is not subject to me'ila. Once the water was placed into a flask, it is subject to me'ila. The willow branch is not permitted for benefit and is not subject to me'ila, but Rebbe Eliezer, the son of Sibzadik, says the elders used to place the branch in their lulavim. A bird's nest atop a tree of hegdish is not permitted for benefit, but not, is, not, is, is, is not permitted for benefit, but it's not permitted for me'ila. Regarding a bird's nest that is in the shira, one should knock it down with a stick. If one consecrates a forest, everything contains, contains is subject to me'ila. If the temple uh, Bridgerman purchased trees, the trees are subject to me'ila, but the savings and the leaves are not subject to me'ila. Items consecrated by the altar combine with one another for me'ila and do not make one liable for their accounts for pickle, nose, or tummy. Items consecrated for temple upkeep combine with one another for me'ila, and items consecrated for the altar, um, items consecrated for temple upkeep combine with one another for me'ila. Okay, that's it, and I'm done. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.